brother ahmad umar brothers and sisters assalamu alaikum it is my proud privilege to welcome brother abdul ahmad umar on behalf of the young men's muslim association conference to our national headquarters i also take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you for being present here today praise be to allah for having with us brother umar to speak to us on islam and christianity you see before you a young handsome professor of mathematics from toronto canada being tv broadcaster and author of several islamic publications he has become an authority on this particular subject i'm sure he will testify his thoughts to the conviction of all of us there have been many people or rather some people to whom i have spoken to in fact it is not the subject that should have been the theme of tonight's lecture i have no hesitation in agreeing with these people the intention of our speaker for tonight or any person associating himself officially with this lecture or to decry and tax the susceptibilities of our Christian brethren. I am quite certain that it is not the intention of our speaker for tonight. It is a subject of tremendous interest about the viewpoint that tonight's speaker is going to put forth. I do not believe that his intention is holding this lecture is to touch the susceptibilities of our Christian brothers. I don't believe that. But I do believe that in the progressive society, one should not be inhibited to discuss matters even by pornography. There appears to be controversy. After all, if we are going to be inhibited discussions, discuss with dignity, with respect for the other man's feelings, if these are going to be inhibited, then i am afraid it will be, it will result in intellectual stagnation and it will be a sad day for any community once has intellectually stagnated so i don't think that one needs to offer any apologies to anybody for tonight's subject of discussion now as it is customary at meetings of the ymma at the end of the lecture there is going to be a question, a question time and therefore I do not want to take any more of your time because the less I talk that there will be more time available for discussion and questions. But before I call upon the speaker, I wish to thank the Islamic Information Center for giving us this opportunity to have this lecture at our headquarters. Now I have great pleasure in calling upon the learned lecturer to address you on the subject Islam and Christianity. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome. I guess I have to start by telling you what I'm not. Uh, I'm not attached to some institution. I don't work these days. Last couple of years I haven't been working so long. I'm not a professor of anything these days. Uh, I took a year off and it is stretching into three years. I have to get back to work someday. So I'm not associated with somebody. I don't want to embarrass some institution or myself. I'm also not uh, in the business of traveling around and giving uh, testimonials. That is uh, telling people, you know, I used to be that and it was so bad and now I'm this and it's so good. I'm not in that business either. I just had in mind to uh, possibly bring to your attention some things that uh, maybe you uh, have heard of before, but you thought, well, that's all been figured out a long time ago. That's all old business. As to discussing Islam and Christianity, Muslims and Christians have been doing that from the start. There's an interesting uh, booklet uh, recently printed uh, in England at the Islamic uh, Institute in Leicester which records the history of the first encounters with Christians and Muslims. How even in the time of the Prophet himself, the Bishop of Najran came with some of uh, his people to Medina to meet the Prophet. They wanted to discuss 
Islam and Christianity. And the Prophet said, make yourself at home in the mosque. And so they stayed in the mosque and uh, went on for some days of discussion. As to the subject at hand, Islam and Christianity, I'm afraid that the Muslim very often wants to um, take one big wide brush and use it to paint all the Christians one color. They ask simple questions like, what do Christians believe? Do you know that's a more difficult question to answer than if somebody asked me, tell me what do Americans eat? All kinds of things. And what do Christians believe? All kinds of things. You have all sorts of people who say, we are the true Christians and those are the false Christians. And if you go down the street, that's the group who's saying the same thing. They say, no, we're the true Christians, those are the false Christians. There's hardly one statement that you can make about Christianity that every Christian would say, yes, that's true, that's what we believe. They come in all kinds. So please understand that, that if I try to talk about Islam and Christianity, anything I might say, there will be some Christians who will say that's absolutely right, and there will be some who will say, no, that's wrong. So it's not as though Islam has some kind of a, a view which is exactly opposite to what Christians have. As a matter of fact, there is virtually nothing that you could find anywhere in Islam that you can't find a church somewhere who says the same thing. Just recently there was a little book published by an American evangelical church on an important subject. They say, one thing they know for sure, whatever Christianity is, we know one thing for sure, Christians shouldn't eat pork. They make a very big case out of it. Prove it from the Bible. It says, according to the Bible, a Christian should not eat pork. They stick to that very firmly. It's just showing you. Here's one thing out of many, many things. Somewhere you find a church who will say, on that issue, the Muslims are right. So what I'm trying to say is don't be confused if you have this attitude like, well, there's them and there's us. It's not as simple as that, uh, not nearly. There are many who approach very close to the Muslim idea on uh, virtually everything. And so it is that the Muslim is not supposed to be in the business of saying to people, uh, leave what you have and take what I have. He's not supposed to do that directly. That's not a starting point. The message of the Quran to every human being is, whatever you have, be careful. Don't commit excess. Stick to what you know for sure, but don't exceed your own authority. If you say this and this and this, and you can prove it, that's good, it's true, we all believe it. But when you come to this subject or that subject, do you have proof? If you don't have proof, then you should be quiet. Even if you're right, you should be quiet, unless you have proof. Commit no excess. So, this exercise is not supposed to be some kind of a harangue or whatever to say, uh, look at them and they have this idea and look how silly that is or whatever. No more so than the reasonable Christian would say that of Muslims. There again, you find people in one description or another. Just a few months ago, a man who is probably the leading uh, intellect in the Catholic Church Hans Kung made his comment on what he thought the Koran was. He studied the Koran carefully and he said, God has spoken to man through the man Muhammad. Now that's what Hans Kung says about the Koran. The New Catholic Encyclopedia says in an article on the subject of Koran that people have tried to explain it away for years. And in their own words they say, out of all these explanations that have been offered to say it came from here, it came from there, it's not really a revelation. Their own words, they say today, no sensible man accepts any of these theories. In other words, there still is not a sensible explanation for what is it if it isn't a revelation. So, some people are not automatically against you, is what I'm getting at. They call things for what they see things to be. A hundred years ago, in the 1880s, 
ันพบ